uh, getting married, and uh, actually there was a Rebbe here, he's not here anymore, who every uh, Parshas Chai Sora would give a kind of a private shear in his house for people who either got married or were in the process of getting married to give them lessons of Shiduchim. I'm not going to do exactly that, but uh, also I'm going to speak about this in a more general way. And that is, you'll remember that of the three Avais, Avram, Yitzhak, and Yaakov, so Yitzchak is the only one who is not allowed to go outside of the land of Israel. Avram Avinu uh, left Eretz Israel to go to Mitzrayim uh, when there was a famine. Uh, Yaakov spent many, many years uh, in Lavan's house, but Yitzchak was not allowed to leave Eretz Israel. And the reason is that since he was a sacrifice, he was a korban, he had a certain level of holiness. And because of his holiness, he was not permitted to leave the holy land. So as a result, when it's time for him to find a wife, unlike uh, Yaakov, who went to Haran to find his wife, Avram Avinu had to send an emissary, and that emissary was his faithful servant, Eliezer. Now, uh, it's very, very interesting that the amount of space that the Torah devotes to Eliezer finding a wife for Yitzchak is very, very long. It's extraordinarily long. And the Torah repeats it in different ways. There is the story as it unfolds. And then, when Eliezer recounts the story, first to Besuel, that is Rivka's father, and then to Lavan, he, the Torah recounts all the details. For example, the Torah could have said, you know, A through Z happened, and then it could have said, Eliezer told Lavan everything that happened. But instead of saying, Eliezer tells Lavan everything that happened, it actually repeats all the details. Now, we know that the Torah is normally very economical with words. The Torah will not waste an extra word or an extra letter. So why does the Torah repeat all of the events in the reiteration of Eliezer to Lavan when the Torah already told me what happened? And it could have just said, Eliezer said to Lavan everything that happened. So the Gemara itself says that this is a sign of God's love for everything that is connected to the Avais that it says that even the casual conversation of the servants of the Avais is more beloved to Hashem than even the Torah that the children keep. Because many, many halachos in the Torah we derive from a single letter or a single word. The Torah doesn't bother to spell it out. But here the Torah goes on and on and on and on because everything connected to the Avais is very, very beloved by Hashem. But what's interesting is that, and this is very important generally, that whenever the Torah repeats a narrative, you have to pay attention not only to the repetitions, but also to the discrepancies. There are differences, meaning the way Eliezer tells it over is not the way it happened. Eliezer deviates from those details, and those details are recorded. And the question, therefore, in fact, in many, many ways, the secret to why something is repeated is so that you'll focus on the differences in how it is repeated, and that's going to make a very big difference. The Abarbanel, the great commentary of Abarbanel, I think lists over 50 differences between the events as they happened and the events as they are recounted by Eliezer. Uh, many of the differences are very tiny, microscopic. It's hard to see the significance. But I'm going to focus on maybe three or four differences that might be major and see what type of lessons this teaches us. First, the story as it unfolds is Avram has a conversation with his servant Eliezer and he makes Eliezer swear that he will not take a wife for Yitzchak from the women of Canaan. We live in Canaan, but I don't want these women. But you will go El Artsi, the El Moladeti. You will go to my land and my place of origin, and you will take a wife for Yitzchak. So note, uh, if you read it very literally, Avraham did not directly say, you must go to my family. Avraham did not say, go to my family. Avraham said, go to my land and my place of origin. Now, when Eliezer is recounting to Lavan this conversation and the oath that he took, he changes the words from artsi and moladeti, land and origin, 
to base avi u mishpachti, my father's house and my family. So this is already a subtle change number one. Avram emphasized place, geography. Eliezer changed it to refer to family. Okay, that's difference number one. Uh, difference number two, as, they're, as they continue to be conversing, Eliezer says, well, what if I go to this faraway place and the woman does not want to go with me or her family does not let her go? Shall I bring your son there? Shall I take Yitzchak and bring him there? And Avram responded, in the event as it unfolded, under no circumstances shall you take my son there. If the woman does not want to go, you are released from your oath and we will, we will take a Canaanite woman. In other words, Avram basically said, it is so important that Yitzchak not leave Eretz Yisrael, that we will be mavato the Shidduch for that reason and we'll find somebody here. Interestingly, when Eliezer is recounting it to Lavan, he also recounts that I asked my master, what if the girl doesn't want to go? And he just says, my master said, Hashem will surely bless you and it'll work out. In other words, he makes it optimistic as opposed to, that other, as opposed to saying that if it fails, you know, you've got to stay in Eretz Israel. So that's discrepancy number two. Now, issue number three. When Eliezer finally arrives to Charan, now Charan is really where Syria is, right? It's northeast of Eretz Israel. So Eliezer devises a test to see if this is the right woman. And the test that he devises is not superstitious. People sometimes think, oh, it's like an omen, uh, the first woman wearing you know, a black dress. Uh, that's not what it is. This is not a superstitious test. This is a test of character. This is a test of midos. And in particular, this is a test of kindness, rachamim, compassion. And the test is that uh, girls or women are going out. Remember, according to Chazal's tradition, Rivka was only three years old. Everyone uh, finds that very difficult to, be, uh, to believe. But the truth is, you know, see kids around here, you know, very little. You know, they seem to go around. So it's not so difficult as you might imagine. But there is a machlokas among the uh, Rishonim, among the Midrashim. Was Rivka th a three? Or was Rivka 14? So some will make her a little older. Either way, though, let me point out, there is a very big age difference in here, uh, uh, between Rivka and Yitzchak. Yitzchak was 40 years old when he married Rivka. That's in the Torah itself. But see, the Torah doesn't say how old Rivka was. So Yitzchak was 40. His wife was either 3 or his wife was 14. So there is going to be a very big age difference. But be it as it may, Eliezer says, the woman that says, I will give you and your camels water to drink, that is the woman that God has designated for Yitzchak. In other words, he is testing for a specific quality. The specific quality is kindness. Now, did Rivka pass the test? So this is very interesting. What Rivka did was not exactly what Eliezer proposed. Eliezer proposed the woman that says, I will give you and your camels is the right woman. Rivka didn't do that. Rivka drew water for him. And only after he drank did she then say, I will go back and draw water for the camels. So did she comply with his test at 100% correspondence? The answer is no, but she did better. In other words, the way she did it was actually a much more kinder gesture than the way he proposed. And this is in three ways. Number one, if she would have said, I will give you and the animals, that's kind of equating you and the animals. This way, she gave him, he drank, and then she mentioned the animals. So number one, it's a much more respect, respectful way of talking. Number two, if I tell you this water is for you and your animals, you may be reluctant to drink everything you need because you got to save it for the animals. But Rivka said, this is for you. And that gave Eliezer the green light to drink as much as he needed. 
And then she got from the animals. And number three, you know, she's a little girl. She goes up to draw the water. I mean, it's, that's a big effort by saying, I'm going to make an extra trip to draw the water. So, on one hand, did she do what Eliezer proposed? She did not. But that doesn't throw anything off, because if anything, she did more than Eliezer proposed. Eliezer's whole test was chesed. So instead of her getting 100 on the test, she got 110. Meaning to say, yeah, she didn't do exactly what Eliezer proposed, but so what? She did better. So that's why that's not a problem. Now, here's the thing. When Eliezer recounts to Lavan what happened, by the way, let me just clarify a little bit. I'm switching between Lavan and Besuel. Remember, Besuel is Rivka's father. Lavan is Rivka's brother. Now, you'll notice in the conversation that initially Eliezer is speaking to Besuel, and then it seems to be that Lavan takes over. And the Chumash doesn't explain why, but Rashi, based on the Midrash, gives us a little backstory that, in fact, um, Lavan saw all the jewels and gold and silver that Eliezer was bringing, so he, he figured, let's just kill Eliezer, and we'll take the jewels, and we don't have to give up our sister Rivka. And therefore, he put poison in Eliezer's food, but the poison got switched, and Besuel ate it instead of Eliezer. So as a result, uh, Besuel happened to die, and Lavan kind of takes over the, the negotiations. That, that explains the shift from Besuel to, to Lavan. <laughs> but when he's talking to Lavan, and he says, I pray to God that the girl that offers me and my camels is the right one. And he just says, and Rivka offered water to me and my camels. In other words, in the actual action as it unfolded, Eliezer proposed 100 and Rivka did 120. But when Eliezer tells the story, he says he proposed 100 and Rivka got 100. He doesn't mention the extra credit aspect. That's a discrepancy. Why does Eliezer make it more exact than it actually was? Now, next discrepancy. After Rivka passes the test, and of course, uh, extra credit, 110, 120. Eliezer gives her the jewelry. And only after he gives her the jewelry, he says, oh, by the way, uh, who is your father? When he says it over to Lavan, he says, she passed the test. I asked her, who is her father? And then I gave her the jewelry. Now, Rashi explains that the reason Eliezer said it that way is because if he would have said, he gave the jewelry first and then asked, who's her father? Lovin would have said, what type of idiot are you? What are you giving away the jewelry before you know who she is? So Eliezer wants to make it more logical, coherent story. So Eliezer says, I asked first. But the question is, if it's logical to ask first, then why didn't Eliezer ask first? Why did he give her the jewelry before he asked? In other words, why didn't he do what logic would indicate? Now, a final point is not a discrepancy, but it's an observation. I've been saying throughout the class, maybe a hundred times, that the servant is Eliezer, Eliezer, Eliezer. If you open up the Chumash, you will actually see that although we know from other places in the Chumash that Avram had a servant, Eliezer, but his name is not mentioned here. His name is not mentioned. We're so, we're so used to the fact that Eliezer was the guy that we imagine, and this is a common problem people have, we sometimes imagine things because we're so familiar with certain aspects of the story that we could like, almost swear, shouldn't swear, but we could almost swear that it's in the Chumash itself. Uh, it is not in the Chumash. The Chumash does not say Eliezer was sent on this mission. The Chumash just says, Eved Avraham, the servant of Avram. Now, we know Eliezer was a servant of Avram. He is mentioned by name in other places, but he's not mentioned here. Why is that so? Why is he so-called? Why is he anonymous here? Now, final discrepancy, 
again, I, I, I know it would be hard to remember all of them, but as, when we answer them, I'll, I'll go over each individual one and, and show how it's explained is not a discrepancy in, in the words, but in, it's really a discrepancy in the spelling. So you'd only notice it if you actually look at the words of the Chumash. When Eliezer says, perhaps the woman won't want to go, what should I do if the woman doesn't want to go? So the word for perhaps, or maybe, is the word ulai. Ulai le'isha Perhaps the woman won't want to go. So the word ulai is spelt without a vav, without a vav. And since there are no vowels in the Torah, the three consonants, aleph, lamid, yud, could be read a lie to me. There's ulai, maybe, to me. And Rashi brings a medrash that Eliezer himself had a daughter. And he was hoping that perhaps Avram would choose Eliezer's daughter to be the wife of Yitzchak. Eli, Eli to me. And, Ash, and Avram said, no, because you're a Canaanite, and Canaanites are cursed, and uh, those who are blessed should not connect to those who are cursed. So the Eli, Uli, has a double entendre. Uli means maybe, perhaps she won't want to go. Eli means, what about me? Now, what's interesting is the double entendre only appears in Eliezer telling the story over to Lavan. In his actual conversation with Avraham, Ulai is spelt with a vav and it only has one possible meaning. Perhaps. In other words, the statement that I have a daughter and I would like her to marry Yitzchak does not come out in his actual conversation with Avra. It only comes out in his recounting the conversation to love him. Why is that so? In other words, the implication is he actually didn't say it to Avram about his daughter. Okay, so a lot of discrepancies. This is what is so significant. Whenever the Torah repeats something, you got to pay attention not just to the repetition, but you've got to pay attention to the differences. They're very important. So here, let's start with a very basic idea. Eliezer is Avram's servant, but he's also Avram's disciple. He is a tzaddik. He is a righteous person. He is one who learns Torah. He is one who has taken on the practices of Avram. Why would Avram not want Eliezer's daughter and instead send Eliezer all the way to Haran. Now, the people of Haran are idol worshipers. They're pagans. Whether they're, they're Avram's family or not, they are pagans. They're of the Avodah Why would Avram reject Eliezer in favor of of the Avodah Why would that be so? So the Drusha Saran, Rabbeinu Nisim, uh, one of the great Rishonim who lived in the uh, 1300s, the 14th century, says a very, very powerful idea that we should think about in our own Shiduchim. And he says that it is true that the people of Haran were idol worshippers. But Avram Avinu knew that the people of Haran had the Mida of kindness and compassion. So the Ran says, if somebody is an Oved Avodizara, they are operating under a theological mistake, a religious mistake, a, cogni a cognition mistake. They're not thinking properly. Mistakes in your thinking, mistakes in your beliefs can be corrected by education, by exposure. But mitos are very, very difficult to correct. You either have them or not. Now, now, God forbid, we don't mean to say that Midos cannot be corrected. Of course they can. But it's a very, very difficult process. And Rabbi Sol Salanter uh, famously said, it is easier to finish the entire Talmud than it is to change one negative Midah. So says the Ran, Avram preferred to make a Shidduch with an idolater who had the midas of compassion 
as opposed to the Kananim, because here's what the Ran says. The Kananim in their nature were cruel. The Kananim in their nature were not kind people. Now, now again, I think we have to assume Eliezer worked on himself. We have to assume Eliezer was kind. But the pshat is that even if you're kind, it's like a cancer that lurks inside of you. So the nature may reemerge generations later. And Avram Avinu didn't want to start a nation that was based on any aspect of cruelty or meanness of spirit. And therefore the Ran says, Avram opted to take an Oved Avodazara, Ovedas Avodazara, with the Mida of kindness over and above a from person who had a certain inclination towards cruelty. Now, again, I'm not, I'm not necessarily applying this Ran Lahalacha Lamaisa. You know, if you were to come to me and say, well, I have two uh, girls that I'm considering uh, marrying. Uh, one is a uh, Jew for Jesus, but she has the kindest heart in the world. Uh, and the other is a from girl who's not so kind, but you know, I mean, obviously, we're not going to tell you to marry, I mean, marry the Jew for Jesus or whatever it would be. But it is an important point that it highlights that the most important thing you look for in the Shidduch is the meat of kindness, compassion, chesed. Uh, and the truth is, that's what a woman should look for too. But, but certainly, at least directly, the Ran is talking about what does a man look for in a, for a woman. See, I don't want to get into a whole speech about this, but sometimes in the religious world, we emphasize many, many things that, you know, they have some importance. I'm not saying they have no importance, but they're less important than more important things. So people will say, oh, is she a girl with a smartphone? I can't go out with girls with smartphones. Uh, or, you know, does she have uh, internet access? And, and people, you know, and these are deal breakers a lot of times. I mean, people will say, I will not go out with a girl with a smartphone. I mean, I get this question quite a lot, you know. Beautiful girl, be I mean, beautiful, I mean, Midos, Sadekes, righteous, but she has a smartphone. What, I mean, to me, you know, I don't know, maybe, maybe I'm, I'm tainted as an American rabbi, but, you know, to me, like, I don't even hear the question so much. Uh, but apparently, this is an issue that bothers people tremendously. But the main thing we should be looking for, the main thing, are the midos, the kindness, the rachamim, the compassion. And even though, as I say, it must be a Dover Pasha that Eliezer was a tzaddik. And certainly the Ran does not mean Eliezer was cruel. That's not shaykh. But Eliezer was kind, but he had to go against his nature. So therefore there's still kind of that nature in there. And that might emerge in the future. You know, 10 generations, like a, like a cancer that emerges. So now, with this Yisod of the Ran, I think we can understand a lot of the discrepancies. Avram, so now I'm going to go in the order of how I presented it. Remember, Avram Avinu didn't say go to his family. Avram Avinu said, go to Haran. Because Avram was not looking for family connection. Avram was looking for chesed, for loving kindness. He says, go to Choran, they're kind there. And that is why, by the way, how did Eliezer know to, look, to, to devise his test? I mean, Eliezer devised a test that tested for kindness. Who told him that that is what he should be looking for? The answer is Pashat. The very reason Avram is sending him to Choran and not accepting Eliezer's own daughter is precisely because in Haran they're kind. Therefore, what is Eliezer supposed to look for? A woman who exemplifies the highest level of kindness. In other words, in a sense, Avram told him what to look for. Because otherwise you'd have Akasha. Who told Eliezer what quality? There are many qualities. Right? Uh, the woman that doesn't have a smartphone will be the right wife for Yitzhak. Right? Uh, Eliezer didn't, didn't go in that direction uh, and, and, and the like. I don't know how many people in Haran had smartphones anyway, but okay. Now, here's the thing. Eliezer comes to Lavan. No, Basuel, Basuel dies, then Lavan. Eliezer is a very faithful emissary. 
Eliezer needs to convince this pagan family that they should let their little daughter go a thousand miles away back to Eretz Israel, And maybe they'll never see her again. In fact, they, they do never see her again. So Eliezer has to flatter the Mechutanim. So, look at how he does it. He changes the mission by saying, the great Avram, who's famous, who's rich, who's well-known, who's respected, he sent me a thousand miles to get you. So he couldn't just say, oh, he told me to go to Haran and pick, pick a nice girl. I mean, that wouldn't flatter them. That wouldn't impress them. So he has to say, he sent me to you, family. So the change from geography to family is that Avram may not have been so interested in family. Avram was interested in Chesed, and Haran was the geographical place of kindness. But since Eliezer wants to flatter the Mechutonim, he has to change it from geography to family. Now, that also explains the sequence. Eliezer gave her the jewelry, and then he asked, who's her father? Because again, in terms of Eliezer's mission, he didn't have to know who she was. I mean, he wanted to know eventually. But she passed the test, that's enough. You see, Eliezer's very smart. This, is, this gets kids in trouble. Maybe you've gotten in trouble this way. When you lie, you've got to be sure to make all of your story consistent. Otherwise, you get trapped. You see, if Eliezer would have changed the mission, he changed the mission from place to family. If he then would have said, and I gave her the jewelry, and then I asked Basmiat, they would say, well, wait a second. You were supposed to get a girl from a specific family. How did you know that? So Eliezer himself didn't have the problem because he wasn't told to go to a specific family. But once he changed it to family, he had to change the order. I, gave, I asked who she was, then I gave her the jewelry. You see, he's, he's making, it, making it consistent. Now, what about the idea that Rivka did not do exactly what Eliezer said? Eliezer said, the girl that offers me and my camels is the right one. And Rivka didn't say, I'll give you and the camels. Rivka said, you drink? And only after mm -hmm. Eliezer drank, she went to the camels. So again, listen to this. In terms of Eliezer's mission, this made perfect sense. Eliezer is looking for kindness, and as I said before, Rivka went beyond his parameters. She was more kind. But when he's presenting it to loved one, he's presenting it as a superstitious omen. In other words, one, he's appealing to the ego by saying Avram wanted the family, and then he wants to show him superstitiously. This must be what God intended, or God's intended, because I proposed A, B, and C, and A, B, and C happened. Now, the thing about an omen is close enough is not enough. Omens have to be 100% exact. And therefore, Eliezer had to make Rivka's behavior correspond exactly to the test. In other words, in terms of Eliezer, who the only thing he was looking for was loving kindness, the fact that she went beyond the call of duty is even better. But for an omen, that's not going to work. And that's why uh, Eliezer has to make it exactly the same. So in other words, Eliezer is using two strategies so far to convince Lavan. One is the appeal to the ego by saying the great Avram wanted you, not just Haran, wanted you. And the second strategy is to say, this must be from God because I proposed something and it happens exactly this way. And you're a superstitious guy who believes in omens and therefore... Now, the idea of when Avram said, oh, I'm sorry, when Eliezer said, what if the woman doesn't want to go? Shall I take your son there? And Avram says, chas shalom, under no circumstances, take my son there. When Eliezer recounts that I asked my master, what if the woman doesn't want to go? And Avram said, everything will be fine. Why doesn't Eliezer make the point? that Avram said, Yitzhak cannot come here. Because once again, 
if you're trying to flatter the mechutanim, you don't want to say, oh, Avram said, chas v'shalom, that Yitzchak should ever set foot in your house. Not so good. So Eliezer is very, very diplomatic. You see, that's why he omits that particular, particular detail. Now, the next point was the double entendre. I have a daughter, and Avram rejected. But that comes from the omission of the vav in the word ulai, which can then be read elai. But that omission does not appear in the actual conversation with Avram. So here's something else you see about the greatness of Eliezer. Eliezer is choosing to reveal a personal pain and humiliation that he suffered. I mean, imagine how Eliezer feels. Eliezer is a tzaddik. Eliezer is righteous. Eliezer has been with Avram for many, many years. And Avram is passing him over, passing his daughter over. Now, Eliezer didn't reveal that pain to Avram. When he's talking to Avram, he just asks the question, what if the woman doesn't want to go? But when he's talking to Lavan, and he wants to maximize the probability of success, look at what he's doing. He's revealing that you guys, you are so special that Avram even rejected me in favor of you. This is a Messiris Nefesh. In other words, Eliezer is actually revealing something very painful and humiliating because it will maximize the success of the shlichus. In other words, he's buttering up Lavan in three ways. By emphasizing that Avram wanted family, this family, not just Haran. By emphasizing the omen, the superstitious correspondence of the test to Rivka's behavior. And by emphasizing the fact that Avram rejected me in favor of you. Right? This is how he's doing it. Now, if you think about this, this is an extraordinary tribute to Eliezer. Uh, in many, many ways, Eliezer had every reason in the world for this mission to fail. Because if the mission fails and the woman refuses to go, the oath will be lifted. And that puts Eliezer's daughter back into the running. And yet, not only did Eliezer not sabotage the mission, but he did things beyond the call of duty. Because he could have, for example, he didn't have to do this extra stuff. He could have said things as it were. Avram told me to look for a woman from Haran. And Rivka didn't do exactly the test, but she did better. And he could have, in other words, he would be telling the truth. And who could fault him? And yet, not only did he not sabotage the mission, but he enhanced the success even by doing things that were so humiliating to him. And the great thing is, Avram kind of knew that. Avram trusted him. Is Eliezer, the Eliezer has a daughter who wants to marry your son, and you sent him to find another wife. I mean, imagine the trust that Avram had in Eliezer, that he could give Eliezer a mission that Eliezer has every incentive to either sabotage or certainly not enhance. And that is why I mentioned the observation, why Eliezer's name is not mentioned. Again, everybody, everybody knows it's Eliezer. If I ask you, show me in the Chumash where it says it's Eliezer, it doesn't say. So the Marshal says, Eliezer was so subservient to the wishes of Abraham that he ceased to exist as a person. In other words, he obliterated his identity. He no longer had any personal agenda. This is called in Hasidus, bitol hayesh, nullification of the essence. And uh, the Torah is marames to this by not even giving him a name here. All he was was the Eved, the servant of Abraham. Right? Very, very amazing. That was the faithfulness of, of, of Eliezer. Uh, do you want to say that? Yeah, yeah. 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 Okay. It's, it's somehow, um, so 
Yeah, in, in which way would you connect it? To? Like in, in the sense of how much she was willing to, to give. Yeah, well, that, yeah, that's very similar, right? Rachel, we see later that's that selflessness and giving up her opportunity with Yaakov. Yeah, it could, it could be maybe Eliezer was her first precedent uh, for such a mesiras, mesiras nefesh. So what you see from the story, you really see two, two basic things besides focusing on Eliezer, is number one, you see how important the midah of chesed is in a marriage. That when you're looking for your partner in life, you're looking for a person that is kind, that is considerate, that is compassionate, that has rachamim. And although in any specific case you have to have a shayla, but the Ran is suggesting that in some cases this will override other religious requirements. Again, I, I, I'm not, I can't be more specific than that, but, but the Ran is at least teaching me that chesed may trump a lot of other things that a person looks at. Um, of course, uh, the same way that you look for a Baal Chesed, uh, the, the young lady is also looking for a Baal Chesed. <laughs> so Mamela, that creates a certain responsibility on us to cultivate that Mida within our own personalities. Uh, and there's also a subtlety in marriage generally that um, you know, we, we normally define Chesed as giving, selfless giving. But you have to understand that in the male-female dynamic, sometimes the way you give to a person is by taking from them, by letting them give to you. I mean, imagine if you'd be a person, right? You, you hear all these schmoozing about uh, marriages, about giving, 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 giving. So I enter my marriage and I give and I give and I give and I don't let my wife do anything for me at all. Well, how is she going to feel? She's going to feel useless. She's going to feel like a recipient of charity. So you have to understand that part of how you build somebody up is that you're vulnerable enough that you allow yourself to have needs that the other person is making. So there is a notion that, maybe I shouldn't call it selfishness because that's not what it is, but in a sense, to be a real giver, you have to also learn how to be a taker meaning to be open to receive what the other person wants to give you and then be grateful for what it is that you're giving you. That, that's actually very important to so because sometimes a person says, I got to give, I got to give, I got to give, I don't take. But you're depriving the other person of their self-worth, their self-esteem, and the sense that they matter in your life. So that's one thing to be aware of. But there's another aspect uh, you see in the story you know, there's a saying, um, opposites attract. Now, that's a little bit of a complicated idea. It's not as simple as you might think. Uh, in the case of the Avos, we do see this. We see that Avram Avinu represents the Mida of Chesed, loving kindness. Sara represents inner strength and discipline. And therefore, Avraham needed a Sara, and Sara needed an Avraham because you need to balance the chesed with the inner strength of gevura, and the gevura needs to be mitigated and sweetened with the aspect of chesed. Avram's chesed needed Sarah's gevura. Sarah's gevura enabled her to see things that Avram couldn't see. Yishmael is destroying the home. And Sarah says he has to be banished. Avram couldn't do it on his own. Avram could not be the one that banished Yishmael. Sarah is the one that said, you have to do it. And Hashem said to Avram, you have to listen to Sarah. And it, it's only because of what he learned from Sarah that he was able to carry out the Akedah many years later. For Hashem, he didn't have to carry it out, but he, had, he was ready to, to do it, the Akedah, the great trial of the Akedah. So the same way that Avram's kindness needed to be counterbalanced with Yitzchak's Gevura. I'm sorry, with Sarah's Gevura. Yitzchak was a mother's boy. Yitzchak had the quality of Gevura. It needed to be counterbalanced with the loving kindness of Rivka. This notion of balance, harmony. Now, the way it works is, 
it's not simply Avram is Chesed and Sarah is Gevura, Yitzchak is Gevura, and Rivka is Chesed, but rather each one brings out in the other one that quality that would otherwise be dormant or unactualized. You see? So Avram becomes more focused and as strong because of Sarah. Sarah becomes kinder because of Avram. And Yitzchak learns from Rivka. Rivka learns from Yitzchak. That's the idea that each one incorporates in their personality the good of the other. Now you've got to be careful because sometimes uh, if you don't do it right, each one might incorporate the chesronas of the other. They, they tell a, a famous conversation, maybe it's a little off color for yeshiva, but between um, Isadora Duncan, who was a famous uh, ballet dancer, and George Bernard Shaw, famous uh, writer, curmudgeon, that uh, Isadora said to him, uh, you know, Mr. Shaw, if we come together uh, with your brains and my looks, we're going to have fantastic children. So George Bernard Shaw said, well, that's fine. But what if they have your brains and my looks? We're going to be in big trouble. Uh, you know, so <laughs> it can happen. But ideally, in an optimal way, each one learns from the other. Now, so you might think, and I'll just end here really, that this kind of advocates an opposites attract idea. Marry a person the opposite of you. If you're an introvert, marry an extrovert. That's the life of the party, right? If you're a person who's private, marry a person who loves to be involved. And that way, each of you is going to be better. You know, here's the thing. That sounds good in theory. Uh, but that, in truth, that really doesn't work that well. Meaning, if you marry somebody who is radically different than you, that's often going to be a source of frustration. And God forbid, uh, things can break down. So really what you're talking about is, in a much more moderate way, meaning essentially you marry somebody who is somewhat like you, but better than you in, to a certain degree. So if I have an atiyah to be a hermit, you know, I don't want to, I shouldn't marry necessarily a life of the party person. But I marry a person who also likes to be at home, but they enjoy some social. In other words, the point is, it challenges me to go beyond my comfort level, but not to such an extreme way that I can't tolerate it. So you got to be careful. The, the opposites attract has a sense to it, has a good sense to it, but it has to be within the framework of similarity. Because when the similarities are, or when the differences rather, are too strong, you know, you're not really able to combine, right? So we need to modify it um, a little bit. But still, that does mean that you look for a marriage partner that can help me be better in certain areas where I have a certain deficit. It's kind of you marry your better self. So it's still yourself. It's not a different personality. But it's like a better version of yourself. That each one should look to the other to kind of have a vision of, you know, a better, a better part of me, I can see in that person. Right? So those are the two lessons that we see uh, from this process. One is the importance of chesed generally, and the other is the notion of harmony and balance in which one who is nota in one direction needs a certain corrective towards the other direction. So, Mitz uh, all of you, uh, well, I I know we have some people who are married already, but then Bez Hashem, you should be zoche to continue to grow in Shalom Bayas. And for those of you that are still looking, may Hashem be mam see you, a zivuk hogun, with all of the midos uh, that you need to build a bias neman be Yisrael. So, be Thank you for listening to this awesome Ech production. To find out more and to partner in our mission, please visit ohr.edu.